Good afternoon. I'm Kenneth Dyer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our first virtual town hall meeting. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. Thanks to the pandemic, we indeed find ourselves living today in interesting times. While COVID-19 is surging across the country, I'm pleased to say that here, we've had a minimal number of COVID-19 cases amongst our students and employees. Since we gave parents the option to have their students return to in-person instruction, we've had a total of five student positive cases and 12 employee positive cases amongst our over 13,000 students and nearly 2,000 employees. I believe this is a testament to the hard work of our school and district leaders and employees who developed a thorough plan to respond to the virus and have executed it with fidelity across the district. A special thanks to our students and their families for cooperating to make that plan happen. That being said, we anticipate cases to grow in the coming weeks as we navigate through the holiday season and wade into the peak of cold and flu season. But regardless of the situation, we'll continue to communicate and be transparent with you about our cases and we'll continue to keep safeguards such as mask wearing, social distancing, increased hand washing in place for the foreseeable future. We're continuing to plan for the second half of the school year. While no concrete plans for traditional practices like prom and graduation have been announced, we will continue to monitor the CDC and Georgia Department of Education websites daily and we will consult them before any decision is made. We must continue to make decisions that are in the best interest of our students and employees, even when those decisions are difficult or unpopular. But I promise you, we will continue to use the science and the data to guide our decisions. From a policy standpoint, we're continuing to work with the state school superintendent and Governor Brian Kemp to help shape education policy for the year. We're currently monitoring the State Board of Education's deliberations on plan adjustments on the weight of the Georgia milestones in the course test. But regardless of the outcome, we'll continue to provide instruction that is rooted in rigor and relevance. With the legislative session of state government coming up, we have also shared our legislative priorities with our local delegation to ensure they know what our thoughts are regarding key matters like early education and literacy, recruiting and retaining high quality teachers and pandemic relief. Graduation rates for 2020 were recently released and I'm proud to say that for the fifth straight year, more than 80% of our district seniors graduated on time and nearly 90% graduated within five years. I believe this is a, a testament to the level of instruction the students are receiving in the classroom and also the support they're receiving at home. Financially, COVID-19 has provided us some significant challenges. In addition to the $8.5 million reduction in state funding, current estimates suggest that we'll lose about $3 million in state funding due to COVID-19 decline in enrollment. But thanks to years of financial restraint and sound business practices, we believe we're able to absorb those losses without furloughing or laying off employees. Looking ahead, our focus will continue to be centered on navigating the pandemic in the safest way possible for our students and employees while staying rooted in a rigorous and relevant instructional model. In addition to academics, it's critical that we also address the social and emotional needs of our students and families, especially those who remain in a virtual environment. We know that our families often have complex challenges that serve as barriers to learning, and we're committed to providing whatever support we can to adjust those challenges and overcome those barriers. I'm grateful for the role that our parents and guardians play in educating our youth, and I welcome any suggestions on how we can improve parent and stakeholder engagement. Once again, I'm Kenneth Dyer, and I'm proud to serve as your superintendent. Have a great day. Well, first, um, that was a good question. I've, I've heard that several times. Uh, as we stated earlier, we're going to make all our decisions uh, based on conditions. And currently, conditions suggest that uh, we still need two options. A significant number of our parents are not comfortable having their kids come back in a physical school environment. And that's completely fine. Uh, we're, going to we're going to continue to work with those students uh, in terms of their learning and their social and emotional needs. But parents will have the option uh, to keep those kids uh, at home through virtual learning or bring them back to school if space is available. In terms of moving forward for next school year, uh, that decision has not been made. We are keeping all options on the table, and we are discussing the possibility of starting a, a connected uh, virtual academy for Dorothy County School System students uh, who choose to learn in a virtual environment versus uh, the physical environment.
Well, there's no doubt that the pandemic is a dangerous virus. It's uh, wreaked havoc on our community, particularly in March and April and again in July. We've experienced nearly 200 deaths in, in Albany and Doherty County. Uh, so it's dangerous. Uh, but as I've said several times, our first priority here with the Doherty County school system is the safety of our students and employees. If I didn't think it was safe, uh, we wouldn't have brought students back. We wouldn't have brought teachers back. Uh, my wife is a teacher, and I have a daughter who's a student, and they're both participating in in-person instruction. Uh, and I say that to say not that my daughter or my wife is more important than, than anyone else's, but I say that to say if I didn't think it was safe enough for my daughter, I wouldn't bring anybody back. Because uh, I know that parents love their kids just as much as I love mine, and I wouldn't do anything to put her in unnecessary harm's way. Is there a risk involved? Yes, there's a risk involved. Uh, but I don't think the risk that we have is a risk that we can't manage. And we put some strict protocols in place to mitigate the risk associated with COVID-19 in our schools. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that's one of the reasons, along with the cooperation from our families, uh, is one of the reasons why we've seen such so few cases in the Dota County school system in terms of students and in terms of employees. We continue uh, to be vigilant and enforcing those protocols to ensure that we keep our students and employees safe as we continue our uh, in-person learning option. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are not making projections as to uh, if we'll be able to continue in-person instruction or if we will have to pivot uh, to fully virtual again. Uh, but we will continue to monitor the numbers, and that's the number stand right now. Uh, we still feel comfortable uh, providing an in-person option. Uh, I'm quite aware that the numbers across the country are increasing at an exponential rate. Uh, we've, at this point, we've been over 20 straight days of 100,000 plus new cases a day uh, in the United States. But as I mentioned earlier in a response to a previous question, uh, the numbers in Doherty County are exceptionally low. And uh, if we continue to do what we need to do in terms of fighting the virus and wearing our masks, uh, social distancing and being responsible when we gather uh, and gather only when necessary, uh, then we can prolong the amount of time that we are able to provide in-person learning. But I do commit to this, if the numbers increase to a point where we think is unsafe uh, for our students and employees to be in the building, we will pivot uh, to a virtual instructional model. That's an interesting question, and I, I think I, I, I alluded to the response to that question in an earlier uh, question about how long will we be offering virtual learning. Uh, we have begun looking at uh, options for a virtual academy for those uh, families who think virtual education is uh, a better fit for their students. Uh, again, we believe that in general, in-person learning is the most effective way uh, to teach K-12 students. Uh, we, we do understand, however, that uh, uh, some people learn differently and uh, they learn better in a virtual environment. And if a family feels as though a virtual environment is uh, better for their students, then uh, we will try to make sure that we provide that option. So we'll continue to look at uh, a full-time virtual option uh, even after this school year, but that will be placed, that will be in place rather. Uh, with some very stringent guidelines and if students begin to fall behind uh, not be able to keep up then we will uh, encourage them to come back face to face but uh, we are anticipating a, uh, a virtual academy uh, in the foreseeable future. Well uh, the uh, first part of that question regarding whether a student will be counted absent if they're sick and they log in to virtual instruction? The answer to that question is no. Uh, there are uh, three ways to uh, be counted present during a school day in this virtual environment. Uh, one uh, is to log in during the synchronous instructional period. Two is to log in uh, in the asynchronous period uh, and look at the recording of the lesson. And three is to turn in an assignment that was due during that day. Uh, each of those three ways a student will be, continue, will be counted as present uh, or participating uh, during the school day. The second part of that question regarding whether a student will be allowed to sign in late if they have an appointment or if they have some other reason that they can't get to school on time, we try to encourage you to, to make your appointments outside the school day. Uh, we try to 
encourage you to be on time because of the stringent protocols we have with COVID-19, uh, it's difficult to uh, allow a significant number of students to come in late because of the checks that we have to put in place. So uh, some schools have said that if you're going to be late, um, uh, then just do virtual learning for that day. And we're encouraging folks that if you do have to have an appointment, uh, make it in the afternoon, uh, it's easier to uh, dismiss early than it is to uh, have a student come in late because of the protocols that we have in place. So uh, again, I appreciate the cooperation that our families have shown during this challenging and unusual time. And I continue to ask for that cooperation uh, as the schools put safety measures in place that, that are in the best interest of our students and our employees. Well, yes, first the information is reported on our school website and is updated every Friday. Um, the number of students as of uh, this point in time, the number of students who've tested positive is five. The number of employees is 12. Uh, those are uh, relatively no, low numbers compared to uh, what we've been seeing across the country in terms of schools uh, who have cases. Again, I think that's a testament to the procedures and protocols that we have in place, as well as to the cooperation from our students and, our, and their families. Uh, there are no plans currently to uh, do weekly testing. Uh, some folks do random tests. Uh, those are more uh, installations like uh, military bases uh, and some colleges and universities. Uh, I don't see the need for that right now. Uh, if we think that would uh, enhance safety our protocols in our schools, then it's something we would consider. But at this point, uh, we don't see that being necessary. Uh, if cases uh, increase to an unacceptable level, then we'll certainly pivot uh, back to a virtual only model. But at this point, I don't see uh, that being necessary. Well, uh, as I said uh, earlier, um, the state tests are still on right now. Uh, the state school superintendent requ requested a waiver of state tests uh, from the U.S. Department of Education, and that waiver uh, was denied. Uh, I do believe that he's going to resubmit the waiver uh, sometime in the month of January uh, when the current administration uh, uh, assumes office. But even if uh, the waiver is not approved this time, uh, the state is considering lowering the uh, course weight for that in the course test for our high school students. Uh, we want to focus on uh, compassion, not compliance, uh, when it comes to um, our instruction this year. Understanding that students are, and, and teachers and families in general are very challenged, and we don't want them to sh be stressing over uh, high stakes end of the year tests. Uh, we have accountability measures in place with our formative assessments and other uh, accountability measures uh, that ensure that the instruction that we're providing is hitting the mark. Uh, but I think sending the message that these high stakes tests are important, uh, are more important than the uh, physical safety and emotional safety of our students, it, it sends the wrong message. And so I, I support the state school superintendent and uh, hoping that this waiver is approved and uh, that we can focus on the whole child and not just uh, focusing on preparation uh, for a test, particularly in this environment. And another part of that question was, uh, if we administer those tests, how we administer them? Currently, the Georgia Milestones does not have a remote option. You have to be in person uh, to take the test. So that'll be a challenge in and of itself. Uh, if a parent is not comfortable having their child come to school to learn, I don't know how we can convince them to bring them to take the test. Uh, so uh, there's some logistical issues we have to work out with that if the tests are administered. Uh, preferably, uh, the U.S. Department of Education will reconsider uh, the request from the state school superintendent uh, if he resubmits it and uh, we won't have to take the test this year and we'll just use other accountability measures to ensure that students are learning uh, as they should. Well, that's, that's a great question uh, and uh, the Order County School System is uh, has already been taking steps to address the concerns you raised in the, in the question. Um, about three years ago, we started uh, training uh, in restorative practices for our secondary school leaders, 
our middle and high school school leaders and our school resource officers. Uh, in fact, uh, restorative practices uh, is included in our system charter. So that's one of the foundations upon which we, we uh, operate. Uh, we understand that uh, black and brown uh, boys are uh, disciplined uh, more frequently and usually the level of discipline is more severe than their classmates. And that's not acceptable. Uh, so in addition to the restorative practices training, we've also begun uh, PBIS implementation and it's at the majority of our schools right now. We've also uh, established partnerships with Aspire Behavioral Health as well as Albany Area Primary Health Care to provide both uh, school-based and off-site uh, support for mental and behavioral health. Uh, last January, we opened up our first uh, school-based uh, mental health clinic at Albany Middle School, and that'll serve students from across the school system. So we, we understand that uh, that's a significant challenge uh, in society, and the Dota County School System is a microcosm of society, so we're not exempt from that challenge. But we're not running from it. Uh, we're not trying to deny that it exists. We recognize it exists, and we're taking steps to address it uh, because we want to make sure that all of our students are equipped to succeed both academically and uh, socially and emotionally. And we don't want uh, to impede their academic progress or their social development uh, by setting them to the side, uh, they have them feel ostracized uh, because of what they could consider to be unfair discipline practices. So we uh, monitor that and we'll continue to uh, provide training uh, to, Im to uh, impact that in a positive way. Well, let me, let me say, uh, we haven't made that decision yet. Uh, we understand that the first nine weeks of the first grading period was, was challenging uh, because it was all virtual and it was the first time we were doing all virtual instruction. And we, we understand and we saw firsthand how challenging it was for some of our teachers. So we could imagine how challenging it was for our students and their families, particularly those parents who were trying to support and those grandparents who were trying to support students and they're not as uh, technology savvy as, uh, as they could be. Uh, so we understood that and we thought it was the right thing to do. Again, exercise compassion over compliance. We thought it was the right thing to do to provide an extended period for uh, making up grades or re uh, turning in assignments that were missed because of some challenges you may have had uh, with access to a device or access to a reliable internet. Uh, so uh, we did that, but we also understand that there is an accountability piece and students are expected to uh, complete assignments timely and turn them in. Uh, we have opportunities for remediation and uh, great recovery and making, doing makeup assignments throughout the school year in a regular year. And uh, right now our intention is to continue that practice into the second grading period but uh, we have not made a decision to do an extended grade recovery period as we did during the first grading period because we think those challenges and those transitions should be well in place right now where students should be able to uh, perform adequately uh, without those additional supports for, uh, uh, not supports, but additional uh, opportunities uh, for extended grade recovery. So I just want to uh, employ our parents to, to ensure that we uh, work with our teachers and, and check uh, behind the students to make sure that they're uh, staying up to date with the assignments uh, that are due and they turn those in on time. Now with that said, if there's some uh, uh, anomaly, if there's some unusual event or occurrence that took place uh, that prevented a student from being able to turn the assignments in, I call your teacher uh, or, your, or your principal and I'm sure they'll work with you on that. I just want to reiterate my, my profound appreciation uh, for their patience and understanding as we navigate it through, or as we continue to navigate through uh, COVID-19. The start of the school year was certainly something different than we'd ever seen before. Uh, and I would just say we'll see some other firsts as we go through this school year. Uh, I want them to understand that we're committed uh, to the academic and non-academic uh, support of their students. Uh, and we want to partner with them, continue to partner with them uh, to make a positive impact on the lives of our students and impact our community. COVID-19 is certainly something that has hit us hard uh, and we're responding 
in the best way we can by first focusing on safety, safety by students and our employees, and then uh, a relevant and a rigorous education experience for those students while providing the social and emotional supports that they need to help them get through uh, this period in their lives. That's about all I want to say other than uh, thanks again uh, for their support and we look forward to the day when we can all get back together in the school buildings uh, without the risk of COVID-19 and that'll be a glorious day and a day that I'm certainly looking forward to and I'm sure many of our students and parents are as well.